What we really wanted to talk about today um, and kind of release into the wild, into the public for the first time, is our view on really how we continue this journey. We've been working on this for the last 10 years or so, how we really bridge everything from creating data science all the way to disseminating data science inside an organization, right? And we have talked about that in previous years, different bits and pieces of that, um, technology pieces, but now we have all of those pieces and they fit nicely together. And you'll see that in the next 30 minutes or so with the help of Karen and Simon as well, how, we can, how you can actually disseminate data science across an entire organization using the analytics platform to create it and the Nine Business Hub to deploy it. So that's really the ultimate goal, and you'll see this kind of visual metaphor a little bit more often, so very quickly, the orange ones are our data science, data science teams, they can be data engineers, they can be data wranglers, they can be Excel wizards, whatever. The lines make them collaborate very nicely across your entire organization, and somehow all of the cool stuff they're doing is not just deployed to three people, to ten people, but it's really deployed to thousands of people across an entire organization, tens of thousands of people to an organization. How do we do that? How do we get there? And this is part of three slides just on the different pieces that we have right now. Right? There's one piece is, of course, how do you enable experts to collaborate? And the answer there is it's low code, no code, it's visual workflows that allow data engineers, machine learning, AI experts, visualization gurus, they use very, very different underlying technologies. We had summit presentations around these types of low-code platforms for different persona thingies before, but it also allows the Python, the R, the SQL, other coders to collaborate very nicely without having to teach each other all of the nuances of the different technologies. Um, then this is about enabling others in the organization. So if you kind of think about the dot there in the middle being your marketing department, doing cool marketing analytics type stuff, we have a really nice talk, I think, later today or tomorrow from Francesco, who wrote our book, wrote his book. That's part of our Nine Press series. But they are now collaborating with someone in the HR department doing HR analytics, right? They can share using the Nine Business Hub. They can share their workflows, best practices. They can collaborate. And then, so no code visual workflows really for expertise sharing, for spreading data literacy, just for getting started. And then the last piece is how do I get what I'm doing in front of people that shouldn't be working or they don't care about visual workflows. And one way of doing that is using the Nime Hub. It used to be the Nime Server, that's the Nime Hub, allows you to do that as well, of course, to deploy a workflow or a series of workflows as a data app, right? That runs in your browser, down there is a little example. And of course, you can also deploy that as an application service, as a REST service, so that other applications or other machines can use predictions, can use the workflows that were constructed by the data science team. That's something we've had, right? It's very easy. You have the collaboration on the business hub. You can very easily share workflows, share best practices. We have the ability to upload your workflow to the hub. Right, no, you don't quite right click, but a few more mouse clicks later, it's deployed as a data app or it's deployed as a REST service. So it works very, very nicely for a dozen users, for a dozen consumers, for a dozen of your colleagues that just want to use this. But now you want to do this on a scalable basis without IT breathing down your neck and saying, what, are you deploying to 10,000 people? Are you insane? So just very, very briefly, one minute for those of you who are completely new to NIME. We have fundamentally two pieces of software, this NIME analytics platform, and you'll hear more about that in Baron's part of this presentation this morning, but also, of course, you can check it out at the demo booths. We have the NIME analytics platform, open source, free, lots of cool community extensions. So this is really standing on the shoulder of a lot of giants in terms of open source libraries for all of the creation of the data science, all the day bay from data blending to modeling to visualization. And then on the other side, we have the Nine Business Hub. I already mentioned that a couple of times. That's really about this collaboration, get people to share workflows. And you can do that already now with the Community Hub, which is essentially serving the worldwide community of workflow developers, right? Share with everybody out there. Um, and it also allows you to deploy as a data app, as a REST service, so others can use what you built, right? And then, of course, the consumption interaction is, is that piece of it. 
Okay, so how do you disseminate, how do you do that? How do you deploy data apps or REST services really across an entire organization? What do other people do? There is the scenario that we encounter quite frequently, actually, as I call it the scenario of Wild West. It's a really cool team of technology affectionatos. They know everything about whatever. Their favorite platforms, they wrap it, they write their little favorite wrapper, they deploy it some way as a REST service or something, and it runs fantastically. Somewhere, somehow, nobody has control, no gover governance whatsoever. Works phenomenally well, as long as that person is willing to work with you. The moment you get on that person's nerves, Updates will slow down a little bit, and then that person will start ignoring you, right? IT has no idea what's going on. It's, a, it's not really a maintainable setup, right? Works very well, works very quickly to get that first thing in front of people. Try to do that a second time. <laughs> Try to do that repeatedly on a few more applications. You run out of experts doing that. You run out of ways of really controlling what's going on. Then we have the IT scenario, right? You go to the other extreme where you say, okay, Good point. We should really keep this in check and a little bit under control. So it's really the data science team is building cool stuff in whatever favorite tool they have. They send it over to IT. Nothing happens. And then at some point in time, IT says, oh, OK, I mean, that language not supported. Are you insane? What does it do? OK, then they recode what you just built as a data scientist into some other language that's actually supported by IT. They deploy it, and then they say, OK, this is it. Forget about it. But then it's deployed. Your users come back and say, wait a second, this is doing something wrong. So you say, I'll change it on my end. And it takes another three months before it goes out there. So nice, super safe. I mean, the safest IT is always the one that doesn't allow you to do anything. That's very close to it. And then we have this scenario, traditional coding, where we say, hey, but I mean, we know how we do this. This is software engineering all over again, right? So we make data science production really part of our software engineering practice that everybody has anyway. And then all is good. And we'll be talking a little bit about that, why where the difference between continuous integration, continuous deployment, CICD, classic software setup, where the differences are to what you need to do with data science. OK, so some of the issues, and those are just some of the issues that we run into one with this or a wild mix of these three scenarios, is that there's going to be translation errors, right? If you translate from X to Y, you're always going to lose something. Even these strange standards that are supposed to deploy data science models and other platforms can interpret them, even there you have differences. You have 10 to, you can have extremely long de deployment cycles, and governments is always going to be some sort of problem, right? Going back to be able to say two years later, the reason that person did a get, didn't get a credit or did get a credit was that we ran this model based on this data, and that's resulted in this kind of a prediction. Try to do that with any one of these scenarios. So the requirements you really have is, and I'm just going to very quickly go over this one, you do need to make sure, and the reason there's automated in all of this, because it's important, if you really want to do this at scale, to daily updates with a thousand models, with a thousand data science model, you need to do that automatically. Package all of the dependencies. That's something the software people refer to as integration. You need to have some sort of a validation step in there. Somebody needs to look at what you're trying to deploy, or at least automatically check that you don't accidentally do something weird. Check for bias. Check for, oops, there's a password in there. Check for strange database access. Check for, I don't know, formatting hard drives everywhere. Then you automatically move this into production. That should be easy. Um, you, of course, have archival constraints, right? You want to make sure you have auditing capabilities. You can do this two years later going back. You want to be able to make sure you have rollback capabilities. You deploy a model, and the next day you realize, that's just weird. All the credit applications got rejected. What the hell's going on? Whoops. OK, go back to the previous model, right? And explainability, that's a little bit more of a topic than in software engineering, because you do want, in many cases, especially when it's about consumer data, human data, you want to be able to explain later why certain things were done the way they were done. Then we have things about monitoring data science in production. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in 10 minutes or so. Um, in software engineering, you put it into production, it runs. The monitoring there essentially consists of making sure the application still runs. And if it doesn't, you relaunch it, whatever. 
relatively easy. Data science is a little bit more complicated than that because if I'm deploying a model that's making predictions, it's based on data, and at some point in time, that data is not going to represent reality anymore. Just think about book recommendations, movie recommendations, right? If you don't know the new movies of the last three years, your recommendations aren't going to be all that great, right? Not because old books aren't worth reading, but they're also new books that are worth reading, right? So every now and then, you need to, not every now and then, you want to continuously monitor the performance of your model, and then if you realize, hey, it's time, you automatically retrain. And that could have different flavors of it, right? You could say, let's automatically retrain every night. We have customers that do that on product pricing prediction, that type of stuff. Or you only retrain when the model is really out of whack, or you retrain once a month. Depends really very much on the application. That's really it. I did talk often about software development deployment, so just for those of you who aren't from a CI, CD background, software, deploy, software development um, background, this is what it looks like, right? And they essentially have two pieces. They call it continuous integration, which is really about putting all the pieces together. And then you have the piece that's continuous delivery, sometimes continuous deployment, which is about reliably putting that program or the new version into production, right? Very similar to data science, but with a few small differences. The validation is a little bit different. In software, you're running a lot of automated tests. You're not really testing proper run of your <laughs> Nine workload that creates, that trains the model, but you're going to probably want to do different things on the validation side. Make sure that predictions on your best customers don't change, for instance, stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned that already, the monitoring and the retraining, it's a little bit different, and it's going to be, we'll see this towards the end of our little demo session that we have planned, is it actually requires quite a bit of data science experience, kind of on the production side. IT, I love IT, don't get me wrong, Martin. IT doesn't really know what it means that my model is out of whack, right? That's something only the data science team knows. And then deployment, explainability, a few smaller, smaller aspects here as well. Okay, so we'll do this in two steps. We'll focus on the kind of obvious part first. We'll talk about validation and deployment before we start talking a bit more about the monitoring and the retraining. You have seen, some of you have seen both of these sites, but for now we focus on the left side where we say this is really the creation piece and there are different ways of looking at this, Chris DM and SEMA, they all essentially talk about the same stuff. We somehow need to blend, transform data, we model, we visualize, we optimize parameters, models, whatever. We do that, we circle around a couple of times and at some point in time data science team is happy, says yes, this works, let's put it in production. So we do something like this, we want to now validate and then deploy it, ideally, automatically, and then it ends up in a production as a data app or as a REST API. And in order to do that, um, I brought two people along that will do, will do a little bit of role playing now on here. Karin is here with me, one of our solution engineers, come on on stage. She will be playing the role of the user, the data science experts, building stuff. <laughs> Hi, Karin. And Hi, everyone. That applause is well-deserved. She traveled all the way from Berlin to come here. <laughs> um, well, and I think I already hinted at all of this being part of the Nine Business Hub. Why don't we dive right into it, Karen? Show us what yeah, you have. that works. So like Michael said, it's a bit of a role play. So I'm a data scientist working in a bank. And this is the Nine Business Hub where me and my team collaborate on our projects. And we have this one space called the development space. And then here, you can see all of the different projects that we're working on. So one example would be our credit scoring app, where we have this one workflow. And inside of this workflow, we want to deploy it so that we can expose this as a REST endpoint and give it input data with values or attributes of a person and get as an output if their credit score is good or bad. Okay, so this is one of these REST APIs that I mentioned, not, exactly. a, not a cool data app. N not a cool data app, unfortunately. No. But, okay, but we'll hear more about the cool data apps, but it works exactly the same for data apps and REST services, right? Yep. Cool. Okay, so this is using a model that I trained before, and in order to put this into production, my admin team has shared a data app with me, so we are seeing a bit of a data app now. 
Um, the data app looks like this. You can see there's three columns, one which has all of my projects that are in development, one which has all of my projects in validation, and one which has all of my product, projects in production. And I have two projects that are already in production, one risk prediction and one fraud detection. But what I want to do is I want to put this credit scoring uh, workflow into production. So I'm just going to select the actual project. So there's some tests that are happening in the background. And now I immediately see that inside of this validation column, um, my project has been rejected. And I want to know why. So I click on this credit scoring project here, and I see that it's been automatically rejected because I used a deprecated node. I used the column filter legacy node. I could have told you that. <laughs> OK, well, now I'm going to replace this column filter legacy node with the newer column filter, which I'm supposed to be working with. I upload this from the analytics platform to the Nine Business Hub inside of my credit scoring folder, and I'm going to overwrite what I had in there previously. And now I want to run it again, because now there's no deprecated node, so hopefully this will be able to go into production. I can tell you already now what's going to happen. <laughs> but I've seen the demo, so that helps. <laughs> OK, the tests are running, and success. it's in validation. But it says success? Um, yes, because now it has been successfully submitted to the admin team. OK, so what's now? I need to wait on the admin team. You're just waiting? Yep. Uh, let's, for good luck, we have Simon here, who is going to play the role of the admin team. Welcome, Simon. <laughs> All the way from lovely Constance. Hello. I asked him to look a little bit more nerdy, but he refused. <laughs> just, just imagine him super nerdy. <laughs> anyway, All right. Simon, so what's happening on your side? Yeah, so let's dive into it. And I hope, in my case, the data app just works as expected. So you can see the admin, myself, has a similar data app as Karen already showed, with small differences. You can see there are only two columns. There's the validation and the production column, because me as an admin, I'm not really interested in what Karen and the, her team are actually developing. I'm only interested in what is actually waiting for being validated. So let me click refresh. And that's working better. Um, so I can see that the credit scoring project that Karen just uh, submitted actually shows up here. And it shows up as waiting for validation. So I know that the automated validation steps have already been passed. So there's no deprecated node in there. But I still want to take a look at this workflow myself. So can click on it, see the project, and can go into the workflow. And what directly comes into my eyes is that I see a nice workflow, but it doesn't explain to me what it is doing. There is some, for me, there's documentation missing because I think all of you know it's important for maintainability to, to document um, the workflow. So I'm actually going to be to reject this, give a little hint to Karen documentation missing so that you know. She knows why I'm going to reject this project. So I give it back to Karen. And we are quite bureaucratic. OK, good. Back to Karen. What's <laughs> happening now? OK, so let me check on my app what happened to my project. And now if I click on my project, I see um, it's been rejected again. Oh <laughs> it's because I didn't document my workflow. So what I'm going to do to please Simon over here is I'm going to annotate my workflow and overwrite the previous one with the documented version. OK, I'm going to try this again. Good luck. Of course. <laughs> OK, okay. successfully. And we can go back to Simon and see what. Are you happy now? <laughs> Let me check. So I'm going to click Refresh <laughs> and see the credit scoring. He project. likes to be in a position of power. So. <laughs> <laughs> so let me take another look. And I can see nice, well documented. That's really good work, Karen. So <laughs> let me approve that one. OK, we got lucky. He didn't notice the typo. <laughs> <laughs> and if I now click. Another one, a time refresh. The credit scoring uh, project was moved to 
to production and it's actually running. There's a timestamp running since, I mean, just this minute. And um, there's no project anymore waiting for validation. So I'm done for my part here. That's very cool. So this is how validation and deployment works. But I mean, this is very restrictive, right? You have to have these automatic validation steps and then a manual step. Is there any way to customize that a little bit? Definitely. Um, so I was only showing you the, the data app so far, but what you've seen, Karen was showing you the, her team and the, the development space she has in her team. Um, I'm actually part of the admin team, and you can see different spaces I have. Um, let's, uh, we come back to training and administration later. Let's focus on validation and production a bit. So you have seen like the project was moving between different stages from development to validation to production. And what's actually happening is that under the hood, there are also this project is really moving through different spaces. So there's a clear separation between spaces, also in terms of execution. So whatever's running in the production is separated from um, the other environments. And if you, for example, now look into validation, we can see there are different folders and workflows. And those workflows allow to automate these processes. So um, can you dive, dive a little bit deeper? And where this, valid, this automatic validation happens? In that sense, uh, there's this validation controller workflow. Let me open that one a bit bigger. And this is actually the workflow that is going to read in the, the workflow, can submit it. That's going to happen on the left side. And then there is this yellow uh, annotation here where you can see two components. And one of those is actually running the deprecated nodes validation. So these are the, the nodes running the validation. And this is actually where the, this automated validation is happening. So that deprecated nodes validation was failing in the first round of submission because it detected a validation node, a deprecated node. And then depending on whether validation uh, passes or fails, it either goes via green or red branch. And you can also see there's some event logging happening, actually. So we keep records of all events within the system. OK, so this we can adjust any way we want. It's a nine workflow, right? Exactly. That's a nine workflow. Uh, you can just add more nodes, remove nodes, modify nodes, add more validation steps, as you like. Very cool. And in principle, if somebody wanted, they could also change the space up, set up quite a bit, a couple of different deployment spaces. They all end up in the same validation space, end up on your desk, so you can of course, you project could, them. You could add more spaces. You could also, yeah, you can just reorganize it as you like. Um, there is also this administration space where you can have different components at hand that are shared during, in, the, in the workflow, so you can just... Uh, modify them there, and they are like updated automatically in the workflows. You can also see the data apps that, that we've shown to you. You can also modify them if you want to add more interaction in data apps, for example. Very cool. What did I forget? I don't think you forgot anything. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. So that was the validated. Gives you an idea what validated deployment looks like on the Nine Business Hub. It's all fully customizable. Um, let me quickly wrap up that part. Um, so we talked about that one. We really saw these two data apps on Karen's side for the user, on Simon's side for the admin, or for the IT team, for the IT compliance team, call it what you want, it doesn't have to be the admin, but there's somebody who is essentially the second instance in making sure manual what goes into production is actually validated. But um, those are fully customizable because underneath the hood we didn't show those data apps, but those are also underneath the hood workflows that you can adjust any way you want, right? You could have different things. You could make sure that it's only manually validated, it's purely automatically validated, it's all fully adjustable. And underneath the hood, we have a couple of workflows that are part of this administration uh, space that Simon showed that allow to change the logging, they allow you to change what you validate for, they allow you to change how the validation... If you wanted to have three different validation stages for whatever reason, go for it. Um, so validated deployment is usable out of the box. So what you can get from us, I'm not quite sure it's yet downloadable, but it soon will be, otherwise talk to Simon and he will get that to you, is an installation wizard that allows you to simply say, here's my installation of the business hub, click, install this for me, it'll ask a couple of questions around what do you want to name this, and it will give you exactly the setup, right? But that setup is, if my clicker would be working, is completely customizable, right? So you can take these workflows, you can change the logging, the archiving infrastructure. If your IDT department says everything that we archive, that we want to audit later, needs to go into this cloud provider or into this database or on Git, 
You can change that underneath the hood by adjusting those specific workflows. The same is true for the validation workflows. The, two, the one that we have kind of built in looks for deprecated and outdated nodes. That's one thing. But there's, of course, tons more things that you may want to do, right? You want to check for components that are out of date. You may want to check for people, hey, in production, we do not access our internal databases. Maybe a wise idea, so you can check automatically for existence of these types of nodes. GDPR compliance, non-verified components, unknown data sources, maybe not such a great idea. No, in production, we do not write to our internal file systems. All these types of things, whatever well, you can dream up or your compliance team can dream up, you can add that as part of these automated component um, these components as part of the automated validation. And then, of course, we also have, let's see if this one works, yes. Um, you can change, and this is also important, right? Not something we've shown, but if you want to change where development, validation, production environments sit, totally fine. If production is a physically separate instance somewhere in the Alps in Switzerland, Totally fine to do that. You run a business hub instance hosting that space there, and development validation happens somewhere else. If you want to execute validation on your internal cluster, but the deployment, the production runs somewhere in the cloud, also changeable, right? Execution infrastructure location can all be customized. With that, we'll go for the second step. Now let's get interesting. Monitoring, retraining. I mentioned this, right? We need to have a way of checking what's happening in production so that then we can retrain, we can take action, essentially, right? This now finally concludes the duality, right? The Möbius band, I think Ritu likes to call it. Um, from on the one side, we have creation of data science. On the other side, it's not just validation deployment and making sure people can consume it and interact with it, but it's also all of that monitoring retraining step. There's one piece that I need to mention here, even though it's not going to be the main focus. Karen will only very briefly demo it, and we have shown this, I think, two and a half years ago at a summit that relates to this, these two circles, the capture piece and the production package piece. Didn't really talk much about that, but that piece is fundamentally important for data science and completely different from software engineering. Because in software engineering, what the development team does is they build a cool application and then they move this complete cool application into production. No change. Maybe it gets compiled, maybe the debugging code gets cleaned up, but it's exactly the same functionality that they built that moves into production. On the data science side, the data science team is building a complicated NIME workflow that does feature engineering, trying to figure out which features to use, which columns to use, what to do, which data sources to use, tries out five different models, builds an ensemble, does whatever, optimizes the hell out of parameters. That's a massive workflow that's optimizing, that's training, that's learning a data science model. That's not what you put in production. You're not going to constantly in production learn and optimize parameters. What you put in production is the features that were picked, the parameters that were chosen, the models that were trained, right? So you need to have on the creation side that little piece capture that takes all of those pieces and puts it into that production package, and that's what gets moved towards deployment, right? Super important. We've been struggling to really put this in nice terms, but this we enable people to do this through what we call integrated deployment. Do not try to understand this picture. Happy to dive into that over a coffee break. Fundamentally, what happens underneath the hood is that we allow workflow designers to frame pieces of the workflow that should automatically be deployed into production. In a nutshell, what it does is four things. It automatically captures all of the pieces and says, ah, those were the features that you selected, those were the parameters that were optimized, that's the model that was trained in the end, right? You can mark this literally in the workflow saying those are the pieces that need to go into production. Integrates all of the dependencies, right? So that's what, why for us this continuous integration that's such a big problem in software engineering, it's not a problem at all on our end because NIME, the workflow, takes care of that for you. Not quite sure many other environments do it as nicely as that. Um, it then, from this one, also takes those pieces, puts them together, it's all fully automatically and creates this production package, right, which has all of the dependencies and the workflow that should actually go into production and automatically moves that into 
the validation stage that you saw. So essentially, Karen is totally out of, no, you're not out of a job, I'm, but you don't need to go to the hub anymore and click and do things that does that fully automatically, right? That's what integrated deployment gives you, but since that's not part of the CDDS framework, but it's really part of integrated deployment that we've had for a number of times, we'll kind of move that to the side. It is super, super cool though. Okay, so this data science deployment is scale for us. Today, the focus is much more on the monitoring and the retraining. And we'll look at that now. Karen, you need to do a little bit more work now, right? <laughs> I will try. So, um, if you remember before, I had this one project that was in production, this fraud detection project. And that one does exactly what you were talking about, mon about with monitoring. So, I'm going to just delve into the project. We, inside of our development team, have this fraud detection project. And what I have here is I have two folders, a monitoring folder and a training folder. And inside of this, I have my workflows where for we know around about how much fraud we expect. So based on that, if our predictions from the last 30 days don't kind of match what we expect, we want the model to be retrained. And if that's the case, then we move on to the training workflow. And inside of the training workflow, we have these capture work. It's a bit small right here, but you have these capture workflow start and end nodes. So these build the workflow for the production that can use then, uh, so that my model can then be used in production. Cool. And so this is something that I think is super important. You need to customize for each and every project that you're building, right? Of course. Like in this case, we know how much um, fraud we expect, but you can't use that same rule for other projects. So the rule is dependent on the project itself. Okay, so this is in a way a very crude way of doing change detection, where you simply say there's a baseline. If it's exactly. more fraud than that, something's terribly wrong. Exactly. Okay, yeah. but there could be so more sophisticated things that look in shifts of something and look yep. at much more complex scenarios than just tracking one number. Yep. And you don't trust Simon to be able to do that, so you want to keep control over that because yeah, you I wouldn't mean, get it, right? No, he doesn't really know about the business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the piece I mentioned before, right? Software engineering, you put the application into production, you want to make sure it runs. That's something Simon gets, that what it means that an application... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but for this type of stuff, every project that you have that does something cool on the data science side, the way to track for change changes. It's a different thing. And the same is true for the retraining, right? Yeah. Very cool. So what does this look on your side? Totally new app, I assume? Totally app. No, it's the same app, except same app. And you just saw Karen has documented the workflow, so it's already running in production. I already um, can click on it. And it looks pretty similar as to the previous um, Project, but you, what you maybe might can read, there's a little annotation here which, which claims when it, this project has the last time being retrained. So there's automatically in the background running this, uh, this monitoring workflow, Karen uh, attached to the project. And whenever it is detecting that uh, retraining is necessary, it will just retrain it automatically so, uh, and being validated automatically. So it goes through the whole loop automatically. Okay, so you can't read that from all the way back there, but it says last retrain just a few minutes ago. No, yesterday. Yesterday evening, anyway. actually, yes. Cool. But you could also force that, right? There's this little retrain button, and then you say, okay, I don't trust the monitoring workflow of Karen. I True. know better, and I... Tr exactly. Okay. We detect that uh, this is a retrainable project, so there is this retrain button. I could just click, and then it would just... Okay. And then it goes back into validation. Ideally, none of the two components that we've in there will fail because the retraining workflow hopefully builds something cool and well documented. No manual steps, probably, right? Because you don't want to automatically retrain. That should really be part of the loop. What happens if that fails because you're doing other checks on gold tables? Does it still classify super customers as super customers? I mean, if the validation fails, the just the old version of the workflow keeps running in production, so we won't stop the, the production. Okay, and Karen will never know about it, or do we get, does she get a notification? No, definitely, she, it will sh still show up in her, in her data app, and she will see that it has been rejected and that uh, she needs some, to do some fixes on it. Okay, but she could also get emails, other notifications, all, again, that's where I'm going, all this, customizable. This is all customizable. She, we, could, we could notify her via email, via Slack, whatever messenger she prefers. Okay. 
So in principle, there's really two steps, right? That's why it's this Möbius band, because you can stay on the production side and just keep retraining, because it's just training with more recent data. But if it really fails, because reality has changed so dramatically, then it kind of comes back to you, and you guys build it from you and, and start injecting data science expertise. Okay. Awesome. Anything else you want to show? No. I think that's oh, good. it. I think we did. We remembered almost everything. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Michael. And yes, we did practice this a little bit beforehand. But anyway, you didn't notice, right? It looked totally ad hoc. Okay, so that's really the monitoring retraining in production. As I said, this is capturing these pieces, really completing not only the two cycles, but also the ability to go back to creation. Integrated deployment covers this, this notion, this super important notion of being fully synchronized between what you're creating and what actually gets into production, moved into production. To the best of our knowledge, my knowledge, there's no other tool out in there that can do this, not only for a model, but also for the data pre-processing pieces fully automated. Right? There's no involvement needed. It's something that completely controlled by the workflow creators. Um, and then, of course, on the monitoring retraining, very similar to validation deployment, it's customizable. Right? We have monitoring workflows. We have retraining workflows. They come from the data science team, hence the green frames. Not very visible, but anyway. And the orchestration workflows, where the admin team, the compliance team, can essentially say, OK, something that gets retrained needs to pass through these tests. We want to do this. An email goes out to who. This is, gets notified. Whatever kind of an infrastructure, what kind of a process you want to establish for your or continuous deployment for data science infrastructure, you can define it and modify it here. And we have seen people already build stuff super impressive uh, where they actually put retrain models and then they put the old and they leave the old model in production, but they put the new model next to it in production and do A-B testing in parallel for a while before they figure out which one really survives. So you can just... There's no, no limits to your imagination what kind of infrastructure you may want to set up, which is exactly the reason or one of the big reasons why we make this so customizable, because honestly, I have no idea what CDDS is going to look like as a standard best practice in three, four, five years down the road, right? There's going to be a lot of interesting nuances that will show up. You can customize this yourself. We will obviously keep working on those workflows and make it and even more adjustable and offer more, more alternatives there as well. Okay, same slide as before, but in addition to the completely customizable validation, deployment environments, all of that stuff, we have continuous integration, monitoring workflows, retraining workflows, orchestration workflows that also allow you to customize the behavior of the CDDS um, setup. The interesting, really important part is these are typically provided by the data science team. And again, this is a huge difference to classic software development, where once it's in production, it's IT's problem in a sense, right? On the data science side, not so much, right? We need to make sure that the data science team controls what monitoring means, helps define that, controls what happens during retraining, and can be pulled back into action when something goes terribly wrong. So in summary, um, CDDS, complete deployment for data science, continuous deployment for data science. It's really those four areas that we're covering completely now. The validation, the integrated deployment allows the synchronization, as Phil likes to call it, between what the data science team is doing and optimizing and what actually goes into production. The monitoring piece, the alerting, the retraining, whatever happens. You can, you can even imagine other types of alerting mechanisms. Hey, we have seen strange things that maybe not actually need an immediate action in terms of retraining, but do something else. It can all be uh, uh, realized, implemented as part of this, the business sub setup. Underneath all of that, we have the logging infrastructure, the archiving backups, the security setup that you need to in order to do something like that across an entire organization. And of course, the process control, right? All of these orchestration workflows that we have that allow you to define uh, which steps do we do, how and when, and in which order. All of that. Complete choice of implementation, I already mentioned that, the environments, you can spread them out anywhere you want. The demos that we ran, of course, all toy stuff, so it's all running in one hub with a couple of different spaces. These spaces can be separated out, different instances, any way you want that. You could literally make it in such a way that the validation space and the production space are 
outside of even visibility of the data science team. They don't see it, they don't need to see it, right? All they need to see is validation failed and why. Execution, we talked about that you can execute anywhere you want, total different mix, whatever NIME supports, and the same for the storage and the archival. So to me, this is interesting, and it's new in many ways, because we used to add a lot of new, cool stuff, and we will still do that and continue to do that, and you'll see that just in a couple of minutes when Bernd is on stage. Um, we used to add a lot of cool new functionality on the analytics platform side, right? NIME extensions, of course, the type of stuff we provided. Lots of open source extensions where we are wrapping around cool open source libraries, Kera, some of the other ones. Community extensions where, and we'll have a panel on that later today, where other communities are adding their stuff. And I just learned this morning at 7 when he ran out of, uh, out of coffee that there's a molecular dynamic simulation kind of extension coming soon from Slovenia, I think. I need to connect you to Manuel here. He's sitting here in front, by the way. Um, and then, of course, your own extensions. We have quite a number of customers, users, community groups, academic groups that are adding their own extensions to NIME just to be able to play with that. And the business hub used to, used to be, still is, of course, the place where you can deploy that to your organization. And, of course, among others, all of these collaboration features as a data app or as an API service. For the first time, what we're doing is we're adding cool new stuff, and marketing likes to call that innovation. I prefer to talk about cool new stuff, which are the CDDS extensions, right? And that's really only just the start, right? Imagine we're already working, some of you may remember the Monster Model Factory that's next up as an extension where you can not only model the deployment process and control of a couple of workflows, but really orchestrate thousands of workflows that are continuously parallel running in production. And of course, your own extensions. A lot of that infrastructure that we added to Naim Hub, and I know Alexander got very excited about that, is the trigger, the ability to, when you upload a workflow to the Hub, trigger something to happen that allows you to do so many cool things. So that kind of infrastructure is available, very, very cool. I was asked by Tom to now have a little firework go off behind me. We had that all set up yesterday, and then we realized we needed to have fireworkers all over the place, lock this down afterwards for 24 hours, so we decided against that just for a moment, close your eyes and imagine a firework going off. Tom, can you do the kaboom? <laughs> Anyway, this is amazing, right? This is really the first time this type of complete coverage, continuous deployment for data science, I don't know anybody else can do that without lumping together 15 different tools that don't quite connect. Okay, 